Hi there, my name is Vic V. I'm an ENT consultant surgeon working for the NHS in central London. In this video, I'm going to tell you about the relationship between being overweight and obstructive sleep apnea. The reason why I want to make this video is there are a lot of people out there who have misconceptions about being overweight or being obese and how this affects their obstructive sleep apnea. In particular, I hear two statements about being overweight. The first is, you have sleep apnea because you are overweight. And the second statement I hear is, all you have to do is lose your weight and you can cure your sleep apnea that way. So in this video, I'm going to explain what the medical literature says about weight and obstructive sleep apnea, and hopefully you'll know the truth and some hard facts about what is actually going on here. So starting off with the first statement, which says that you have obstructive sleep apnea because you're overweight. So this assumes two things. Firstly, that they gained weight and that's what caused the sleep apnea in the first place. And I guess it also assumes that people who are overweight have obstructive sleep apnea. So what I'm going to do now is show you some unpublished data from my own sleep center department where I've looked at 2,117 patients and plotted their weight against the severity of their obstructive sleep apnea. So here is the chart and each of those blue spots represents one of the patients in the study. Now along the horizontal axis you can see the body mass index. So that means that the further to the right you are, the larger you are, and when you go to the left you become skinnier and skinnier. There is a normal area which I've seen here between 20 to 25. So along the vertical axis you can see AHI which is the apnea hypopnea index. AHI stands for the number of times that you stop breathing every hour on average. Now between 0 and 5 that's considered normal. Mild obstructive sleep apnea is between 5 and 15 moderate obstructive sleep apnea is between 15 and 30 and severe is anything above 30. So you can see from the graph there are some people out there who have a very high BMI and a high AHI but if you look closely you can see some people with an even higher BMI but with a relatively mild AHI. In fact the heaviest person in the study had a mild AHI and if you look on the other end of the scale you can see that there are some people who are rather underweight who have a high AHI. The vast majority of people in this study have a normal BMI when you look at the population of England. The average BMI in England is about 28 and in my study the average BMI was 29. So if you do some clever statistics you'll find that there's a very weak relationship between AHI and BMI. It certainly isn't as strong as most people would perceive. And if you look at it in a different way and use BMI as a marker of obstructive sleep apnea you'll see that it's a very poor indicator of obstructive sleep apnea. It cannot be used as a screening tool. The words sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value are slightly complicated terms but if you don't know what any of those mean use the diagnostic accuracy of the test at the very end. You'll see that it very rarely gets to about 50%. I want to be clear now, so I'm not saying that being overweight is not related to obstructive sleep apnea. There is a relationship, but it's not as strong as a lot of people think. What a lot of us are starting to realize now is that the relationship between weight gain and obstructive sleep apnea is a lot more complex. And in fact, there is an awful lot of evidence coming out now which shows that obstructive sleep apnea causes weight gain. And when you investigate people with obstructive sleep apnea, you can see there are an awful lot of hormones and chemicals in their body which have been altered to make them gain weight. So what I've done is left a list of these chemicals and hormones here. And what they do is that they increase the storage of fat in your body. They stop you from losing fat. They encourage you to eat more fatty foods or more carbohydrates. And on top of that, a lot of people with obstructive sleep apnea are so tired, they can't actually exercise to help them lose the weight. And so they slowly gain weight over the years. And that makes a vicious cycle. That means that they slowly get worse with their obstructive sleep apnea. And they, that causes them to gain weight. And it goes round and round, making them more and more miserable about this. So a lot of people ask me, why on earth is this happening? This is surely a design fault. Why are we doing this? And you have to remember that we're actually cavemen, which is slightly advanced. We're only a few thousand years out of the caves. And so our bodies haven't had a chance to sort of become more advanced as we've become more technologically advanced. It's all about our body's response to stress. So what the body does when the caveman goes through a period of stress, such as starvation or an ice age or a long winter coming through, the body thinks, right, this is a period of hibernation or starvation. We need to hold on to fat. Don't let it go no matter what. We need to get through this. And that makes complete sense. And if you imagine people with obstructive sleep apnea, they're being woken up all night every five minutes or so. And that is translated by the body as stress, physiological stress. And the way the body naturally re reacts to stress is to hold on to fat and look after it just in case uh, there's a harsh winter coming on. It's just the brain's interpretation of what's actually going on. So I see this at work quite a lot. I see people who are sitting in front of me saying, look, I'm trying to lose weight. I've been dieting for years. I'm eating the same food that my wife or, or my partner is doing and they're managing to lose weight. But I can't seem to lose any weight at all. And if you explain to them that it's your body that's really stressed, which is making you hold on to fat, and they suddenly realize that it's very hard for them to lose fat at all because their body's fighting against it all the time. So these poor people who have been dieting for years and years, they're slowly gaining weight instead of losing it. 
And on the flip side, when you treat their obstructive sleep apnea, say if you gave them CPAP and they managed to wear it for seven and a half hours every night, you'll see that their weight just suddenly starts coming off, even without dieting. So I'm a surgeon that deals with obstructive sleep apnea. And so I see a lot of people with very large tonsils which are obstructing them. When you remove those tonsils in a sort of 10, 15 minute operation, these people often are cured from their obstructive sleep apnea if they have very big tonsils. So a lot of people came up to me and said, well, the only reason that's happening is because the operation is so painful they can't eat. And that's true. A lot of people do find it difficult to eat initially. But I tell all these people, look, you have to eat pizzas and burgers and things like that. Don't try and diet at all, for, particularly for the first six weeks. But if you follow these people up who've had their tonsils taken out, after two to three weeks when all the pain's gone, they continue to lose weight over a period of about six to nine months. And obviously these people aren't still in pain and they can still eat, but they just keep losing weight. And if you follow these people up, you'll see actually, how are you losing so much weight? So oh, I don't know, I'm just losing the weight. It's feeling, I feel great. So the question is, what came first, chicken and egg? Is it the weight gain or is it the sleep apnea that came first? And honestly, I think it's different for everyone. It's a lot more complex than people make it out to be. But it is quite interesting that obesity around the world has slowly doubled from 1980. And as a species, we're slowly not sleeping as long as we used to. Initially, it was because of the invention of the light bulb. Suddenly, everyone was staying up late at night to read or do whatever they wanted to do. And then now we've got tablets and mobile phones and working very long hours where previously we didn't have to do that. Well, everyone went to bed around about seven, eight o'clock in the evening. Now, allow me to explain some of the medical literature on this problem. There was a very interesting study which just used 16 people, but on those 16 people, they kept them in hospital and monitored everything they did. Half of them, or eight of those people, they allowed to sleep as long as they liked, up to eight hours or nine hours each day. And the other half, they said, you're only allowed to sleep for five hours each day, no more. Both of these groups were allowed to eat whatever they liked during the day. They're allowed to do whatever they liked during the day. So at the end of the study, after five days, they realized that all the people who were restricted to five hours sleep each night were gaining 0.8 kilograms in that five days. So that's uh, 1.8 pounds in weight. And looking at much more data at 634,000 people in about 30 different trials, it's a, it's a paper called a meta-analysis where they bring all the data together. In that study, they found that if you have one hour less sleep each night compared to the seven, eight hours everyone's talking about, then you are 1.4 kilograms heavier or three pounds heavier than the people who get normal sleep. And if you slept two hours less, then it's double that. Now, I'm not saying that this is actual proof. This is just data that we have, but it clearly points to a far more complex relationship between weight and obstructive sleep apnea. Now let's talk about the second statement, which was all you have to do is lose your weight and then you can cure your sleep apnea. Now this is closely tied to the first statement that I made, which means that if sleep apnea is caused by weight gain, then just losing that weight will mean that your sleep apnea gets better. Now we already know that the relationship between weight gain and obstructive sleep apnea is quite complex, but let's look at the data. So here is another meta-analysis about losing weight and how it improves your sleep apnea. And this time looking at nine different trials and what they found was that if you lost 4.8 points on your BMI scale, on average your AHI would drop down from 52.5 down to 28.3. Now this looks like an enormous drop, almost 50% improvement. But you have to remember, you're going from 52.5, which is very, very severe, Severe is over 30, and you're going down to 28.3, which is still in the very high, moderate, or borderline moderate to severe stage. You have to be below five to be cured. And you also have to remember that losing 4.8 points on the BMI scale means that you're losing 20 kilos or 48 pounds, which as we already know, is quite hard to lose any weight when you've got obstructive sleep apnea. So you do have to lose an incredible lot of weight to go from very severe to borderline severe. If you look at one of those papers in that meta-analysis, there were 216 people and they found that only 24 of those 216 had completely cured themselves of obstructive sleep apnea, which is about 11%. The authors of that paper followed these 24 patients up over the next few years and they found that 13 of that 24 managed to maintain their weight loss and did not gain any more weight. But even so, six of those people of those 13 managed to get sleep apnea all over again, even though they hadn't gained any weight. And going back to those original 24 people that had managed to cure themselves, the 11 that had gained weight afterwards, three of those 11 who'd gained all their weight again didn't end up having sleep apnea after gaining all their weight. So you can see there's something very funny going on here. And if you look at the medical literature, you'll see that about 10 to 20% of people are actually cured if they lose all their weight. But as you can see from that study, a lot of these people end up either regaining the weight and getting sleep apnea again, or even though they've maintained their weight loss, they still get obstructive sleep apnea. It seems to be only a temporary fix. So what I'm saying is that if you're overweight, losing all that weight is unlikely to cure you. But I have to say it will certainly help. 
I often quote that it will improve your obstructive sleep apnea by about 30%, which is what I see in my clinical practice. And I would always encourage people to lose weight if they could. There are so many health benefits like uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, all sorts of things that if you lose weight, it would really help. What I'm trying to say is that it's not the only thing that will solve your sleep apnea problem. So in my sleep centre at the Royal National ENT Hospital in central London, we say to people, often we have to start treating them for their obstructive sleep apnea before they have any chance of losing any of the weight. And what I try and do is do a little bit like a mandibular advancement device or a CPAP device and say, once you're using it well, try on your diet again. You might find that all the weight starts falling off. And maybe this CPAP device or the mandibular advancement device is a temporary thing. Or we can go, well, you could do all of these operations, but why don't we try this small operation, which doesn't hurt too much, and see how you go afterwards, because then you might be able to lose some weight. And then we can regroup and see what happens. So what I try and do is work alongside people and use all the conservative measures I can to try and bring their sleep apnea down without having to put them through a huge operation. But of course, this doesn't always work on everyone. Some people need a big operation. But what I'm saying is that the relationship between weight and obstructive sleep apnea is very complex. So in conclusion, what I'm trying to say is that I think it's the cruelest thing in the world to tell a patient, go away and lose some weight and only then will I start treating you or only then will I give you this operation. Because for the vast number of people that I see, it's almost impossible for them to lose weight. And when you give them a small intervention, suddenly the weight starts falling off and then you can work with them to get them better. So I appreciate that I'm starting to rant now. So if you're gonna tell people that, oh, it's all your own fault that you're overweight and that's why you've got obstructive sleep apnea, go away and lose some weight and then you'll get better, you don't need to see me. I think that's wrong. And if you've watched this video, hopefully you'll agree with me that that is wrong. It's not as easy as that. It's not as black and white as that. So if someone tells you to go away and lose some weight, tell them to look at this video and um, subscribe. <laughs> and, and then I'll stop talking now before I say something silly. Um, thank you very much for watching.